This company was in business for over a hundred years, but I wonder if you've ever heard of them on this episode of Antique Bottle Stories. Carter's Ink Company was a manufacturer of ink and paper products in the Boston area. At one time, it was the largest ink manufacturer in the world. William Carter started the William Carter Company in 1858 by repackaging other companies' inks and selling them under his own name. Two years later, William's brother, Edward, joined the company. Carter had been buying his ink from a firm run by Edwin Tuttle and Orrin Moore. The Civil War disrupted the Tuttle and Moore ink business because both joined the army. So the firm dissolved and William Carter was able to use their formulas on a royalty basis. And he also started making his own inks and mucilage, which is some type of glue. So he moved to a bigger building down the street. Another brother, John H. Carter, also joined the company and then it became known as William Carter and Brothers. In those days, there weren't copy machines or even typewriters yet. The way to make a copy of a document was to write it out with this viscous ink and then press it onto another paper with this pressing contraption. Supposedly with this ink, you could make up to six copies, but since it was so thick, offices needed to have regular writing ink and then copying ink. Carter made a combined ink that was thick enough for copies and thin enough for pens to use regularly. He called it Carter's Combined. Offices seemed to like it, so Carter started advertising it heavily. I have a question, though, that I can't seem to find an answer to. So say you write a paper, you copy it by pressing it onto another paper, wouldn't everything on that paper be backwards? So I guess logically you would use that backwards paper to make the other copies, right? Seven years after being in the business, William's cousin, John Wilkins Carter, joined the company in 1865. The cousin focused his efforts on the ink part of the business. A guy named James P. Dinsmore also became involved, joining the cousin in the ink part of the business. So after 10 years in business, they decided to separate the ink division from the paper business in 1868. Four years later, a fire broke out in 1872. The entire firm, the ink and the paper divisions and their separate buildings were all destroyed in what was called the Great Boston Fire of 1872. I know I've mentioned this fire in other videos. All that was left of this company was the formulas. So that was enough to get started again. After the fire, the cousin, John W. Carter, and James Dinsmore bought out the ink division from the original three brothers, and they started a new firm known as Carter, Dinsmore & Company. John Carter researched tirelessly to develop new and better inks. Carter also hired a chemist to help him figure out how to manufacture the best inks. They sold about 100,000 bottles in 1873, and that's one year after the fire, so that's not bad considering that they just started over. Here's an 1885 ad claiming that they're now selling over 5 million bottles a year, making them the largest ink producer in the world. They made some specialty inks for specific uses, along with many other common use inks. Anything you needed in an ink, they covered it. So since they were doing so much business, they had to move to a bigger building again. They added a few new products like bluing, which is used in laundry to brighten clothes, photo library paste, stamping ink, colored inks, and when typewriters started to catch on, they manufactured carbon paper and typewriter ribbons. Here's an ink eraser with a solution to remove ink spots. After about 15 years on their own, James Dinsmore retired in 1888. Then about seven years after that, John Carter accidentally drowned in 1895 while he was on vacation with his family. The company continued on with new management. Richard B. Carter was still studying at Harvard when his dad died, but after he graduated, he joined the company. Five years later, in 1903, he was the president. Now the company was named the Carter's Inc. Company. 
Under Richard Carter's leadership, the company outgrew its Boston location. In 1909, a new factory was built in Cambridge. They built this huge Carter's Inks electric sign on top. It faced the Charles River and it was a landmark for years. Living up to its motto that there's nothing so good that it can't be better, Richard Carter kept researching for newer and better inks, keeping up with the most recent technology to produce the most current products. In 1910, 13 million bottles were produced that year. This company was ahead of its time, offering lots of benefits to its employees, including a week's vacation, a $10 Christmas bonus, which was basically an extra paycheck, free medical and legal advice, and full coverage if you were injured at work. In the 1920s, Carter began its line of luxury pens. The most famous is the Pearl Tex line. This line was discontinued in the 1930s, but they are still very collectible today. Francis J. Hahn was vice president of technology at Carter's when he invented the highlighter in 1963. Carter's company was acquired by Denison in 1975. Denison made the decision to discard all of Carter's records from the 1860s on, including all of Carter's meticulous ink research records. Denison was bought out by Avery Manufacturing in 1990. There are still few products with Carter's name on them being sold today. So my question is, what happened to those original three brothers? Well, Ancestry wasn't too helpful this time, because their names are so common, and the census records back then in the early 1800s are not as helpful, they don't ask as many questions as other censuses, so I actually don't know. There are a few possibilities, but I would have to dig harder to verify the few that I found, but from what I could tell, they were all born in the 1820s or so, and most of the original members died in the 1890s. There's no telling if they stayed in the paper business or moved on to other things. I really don't know. My Carter's bottle is a coal black ink bottle. This is what the label would have looked like, and it would have had this cork enclosure. I see that it was sold in the 1890s, but I'm not sure until what date. There is no seam anywhere on the bottle except the neck, and there are air bubbles. So I'm going to estimate this bottle to be between the 1890s and the 1910s. I regularly watch videos of people who dig for bottles. And in case you didn't know, the majority are found in old dumps, but some are found in old outhouse sites, which back then were called privies. Privies were used as a toilet as well as for trash. So if you dig up a privy, certain bottles could tell you a little bit about the family. For instance, lots of medicine bottles meant that there were sickly people in the family. Ink bottles meant that they could read and write, etc. It's stuff like that that is really fascinating to me. So <laughs> anyways, that's all I've got for today. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.